Okay, welcome everyone to tonight's board meeting. I want to um, see who would like to start off with the um, motion to uh, approve of the last minutes of the meeting last month. Anybody move so? And I would Someone like to draw, to draw some, some people's attention, attention to uh, email from Dr. Nelson stating that um, he needed a slight change in the minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, I'm sorry. I apologize. I overlooked that. Okay. I move approval with the change. Second to the motion. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, any negatives? Say aye. Hearing none, a motion to approve the minutes has been made. All right. Um, next is the uh, report from the subcommittee meeting. Um, Christina, would you like to take it and uh, run with it? I can. So uh, yesterday was the last official meeting of the Health Department Operations Subcommittee. Uh, the biggest takeaways are that the city is going to continue working with comprehensive mental health on a crisis intervention center. Um, contracts are and agreements are flying all over the place right now, across the country, here and there, um, to get everything done and finalized. The city is also moving forward with a co-responder program. Uh, similar to the CIT officer program that we have right now with PD, but it would be extended out to include fire. So we're working on that and hoping to have that up and running um, the beginning of this next year. In fact, I have three separate meetings to discuss it next week. So everybody be happy you're not all in those meetings with me. Um, then the other takeaway is that, you know, we have a plan laid out. Uh, for the direction of the health department with staffing and services over the next several years, uh, what we're looking at, what we're hoping to add, and, and of course, a variety of ways to possibly fund it. So we're looking at all of that, and that's where we are. Okay. Now. Um, Dr. Morris, would you like to add anything to that? No, there was just a lot of joy on the part of the city staff about the passage of the two proposals the day before. And so uh, money woes are uh, still there, but but better uh, since we'll have a little income coming in. That, and I think that's making them more willing to uh, proceed with the uh, mental health emergency responder program. So at least that was my feeling. So. And then uh, Christina, I um, I just thought it might be nice to mention the um, um, goals that you have regarding um, the um, staff that you're going to get some help from with when it comes to writing your proposals. Yeah, so I know one of the the big asks that we'd had was regarding grant writing, in order to you know be able to fat you know get us to where we need to be a little bit faster and have a little bit more um, abilities to, to pursue different services. The city is contracting with a group um, that specializes in grant writing. And so I spoke with them today and we're supposed to have a meeting again next week. Their whole job will be to not only find the grants for us that meet the specifications I laid out today, but then once I give them the OK to actually write the grant, which I've explained to them, I just simply don't have time to do. Um, and so we're going to to try this method where they find the grants, they write the grants, and hopefully we get some grants that will allow us to start doing some of those goals that we discussed in um, that subcommittee. So we can start moving forward with more of those behavioral health, mental health issues. We can you know, expand out some of our different programs that we really would like to do, but we just don't have funding to extend out at this time. So I am hopeful after our meeting today. And, um, you know, we explained that we we actually do know of a lot of grants. Um, I just don't have time to write a 50 page grant right now. So if they could do that for me, that'd be great. So hopefully we will see some progress there, too. 
Well, I'm excited for the um, for the effort. I think it's going to make a difference, and uh, I'm looking forward to the programs that uh, it'll help you uh, get started and uh, um, provide us with some extra funding for those those issues where we don't have the ability to do it ourselves. And so, uh, okay. Uh, board vacancies and applications. At this point, uh, we've got the, um, um, the city council is going to be looking at the uh, proposals and um, putting, you know, their uh, stamp of approval or recommendations. And um, so that's going to still um, put uh, a couple of uh, gentlemen that have uh, applied going to continue to put their applications on hold till this is all completed. Yeah, as the the board recommended this last month, moving forward with the code change to uh, remove the either residency requirement or ownership of a business. So I went back and I double checked to make sure that everything was written how we needed to be written with our, our law group. Um, Everybody is in agreement that it looks good, so I'm going to be adding it to uh, the next city council study session, which is not this Monday, but the following. And so it'll get us first reading, and then in December, it'll get its second reading, and it should then be able to take effect. Um, so we will be ready to go for 2022. Okay, sounds good. Any thoughts or comments regarding that particular issue? Okay. Would you, uh, would you uh, um, review what the problem was um, with the applications or the the issue? Okay. the The uh, issue was if you were practicing in um, independence and owned your own practice, then you were qualified to uh, apply for a seat on the uh, council. I mean the board, but the, the issue was that not everybody would own their business and the practice of medicine or uh, dentistry. And so with this change, you all you have to do is, is be a, uh, an employee and work in the city of Independence, and then uh, you're eligible for the um, any board uh, in the city. And so, well, I'm assuming that, you know, that maybe no one else has this particular problem on their, uh, but maybe it will become a, they can fix that with some of the other uh, boards as well. But uh, with that in mind, now that somebody doesn't have to ha own the business, but just to work here, then they're going to be able to uh, be considered uh, for the positions that uh, are open. And uh, that's uh, the gist of it when it comes to the idea of uh, having a, a business versus living here, you're always eligible. But if you don't live here, you can, you don't have to own a business at this point anymore. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? All right. Um, the COVID corner, Dr. Terry Morris, our one and only uh, specialist on the uh, COVID bug. What's the good news, Doc? Um, well, good news, uh, it's still there. Uh, I'll run through these reasonably quick. I, I thought it was appropriate to kind of look at the worldwide picture because Although we've seen some improvement here in the states worldwide, there's actually been an uptick in about the last three or four weeks uh, in COVID cases. Uh, this is a graphic map that kind of shows the the, the bullets uh, kind of represent how many cases per million are there. Uh, the uh, government issued a travel advisory to Russia on Tuesday because of their significant spike. Uh, the British Isles has also had uh, a significant spike uh, that's largely uh, the Delta variant, but also a kind of a side variant, the, the Delta Plus uh, that's here in the States, but hasn't shown too much of a big issue. 
um, uh, just to prove that we're number one and here in the United States, we are number one in the total number of cases and we're number one in the new cases per day and we're number one in the cases per million people and we're number one in the deaths and we passed 750,000 deaths earlier in the week. Uh, this is just a CDC chart that's looking at what's going on with this current spike. I'm not sure anymore what spike we call this, whether it's the third spike or the fourth spike or the fifth spike, but we have been seeing a decrease, which is uh, reassuring. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, we're seeing an increase in cases uh, here in the Midwest, the kind of the light purple cases. So uh, Kansas and Illinois, Nebraska and Iowa and Minnesota uh, in the Southwest, Colorado and Arizona and New Mexico have had uh, really significant uh, increases in uh, uh, cases. Uh, Alaska luckily has had a significant decrease, although they still lead the country in COVID cases and uh, providers in Alaska have been faced with who do you put on the ventilator decisions and they've actually had people die because there were multiple sick people and only so many ventilators and some folks got them and some folks didn't and so uh, that's definitely been a sad time to be practicing in Alaska at the moment. Uh, this is a slide I sent out a, a, a little summary from the uh, 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 multi-agency uh, council looking at, at COVID. Um, the counties and metro areas in, in the Kansas City area are still in the substantial and most of them are in the high risk uh, phase for uh, COVID exposure. Uh, this looks at the um, region as far as the decline in COVID cases. We continue to have a decline, although I always like to point out that the slope on the decline is, is much slower than what it was with a previous outbreak, so we're cutting down on numbers, but we're taking our time doing it. Uh, this is uh, the new hospitalizations. We're still averaging 80 hospitalizations per day across the 27 hospitals. Uh, that's still pretty significant, uh, and um, it's actually up almost 2% from the week before, but it's hopefully going to continue a downward trend. Uh, this is the um, Eastern Jackson County Hospitals, the four, and we're still hovering about seven per day of new admissions. That's about 50 a week. That's still a pretty significant number of people getting hospitalized. And if Daryl is on, I'm sure he can uh, talk about what's happening here in Independence. Uh, this is the death rate, uh, which is uh, wonderful. It's been significantly decreased, um, but the people that are dying tend to be in a, uh, a younger age group because we're doing better with vaccination of, of the people at most risk for dying. Uh, this is the uh, Independence webpage, and it's a couple days old, so Christina can tell me if it's been updated, but uh, Independence has had six deaths in the last 14 days. Um, if you look at vaccinations in Missouri, this is from the state's page. Uh, overall, we've got uh, about 90 percent uh, of the 65 and over population that have at least initiated vaccination, about 80% have, uh, have completed vaccination. Uh, most of those are in the 65 and above, um, but the uh, younger uh, folks are working on it and in the 40 to 60% range. Uh, this is an interesting uh, slide from the Mid-America Regional Council that if you look at, it divides it by which side of the state line you live on. Uh, if the population over uh, 65, uh, if you live on the Kansas side, about 99.9% .9 have been vaccinated on, on the end or a, uh, initial vaccination. On the Missouri side, that's about 83%. Uh, and in Jackson County, uh, it's only 80%. Uh, and that didn't let me break out uh, Kansas City versus the uh, Eastern Jackson County.
Uh, if you look at the rest of the population, 18 to 64, uh, for the entire region, about 70% had initiated vaccination. On the Kansas side, about 80% have initiated vaccination. On the Missouri side, uh, in, in eastern Jackson County or in Jackson County, we're looking about 65% have initiated with about 55%, 54% having completed vaccinations. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows that a couple of days ago on the 2nd, uh, the CDC recommended an approved vaccine uh, uh, for uh, children 5 to 11. Uh, good luck trying to get it. Uh, interestingly enough, the CVS and Walgreens and Hy-Vee all signed on to be immunization sites, which I think the pediatric uh, practices did not think was going to happen. Uh, and they're already booked up for a couple weeks just due to uh, as the supplies start to uh, roll out. I think an interesting thing that we're going to have to consider uh, as a medical community uh, and probably as a health de a department uh, community is when do we start rolling over our plans from a, a epidemic slash pandemic uh, approach to an endemic approach. Um, I don't think we're there yet. I, I don't think the CDC thinks we're there yet. It'll have to do with when our uh, immunization rates get a little bit higher. It's pretty obvious that this is going to be like uh, influenza or uh, RSV and there are uh, tens of thousands of people who die every season from those diseases and uh, uh, with the uh, immunity response we're getting from the COVID vaccines, it's probably going to be a annual or semi-annual vaccine to those who uh, wish to stay uh, immunized against it. Um, and we'll see where that goes. Any questions for Dr. Morris? Thank you, Terry. Yep. OK, <clears throat> the um, and that brings us to the discussion on the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, where where do you guys think we need to go with this uh, upcoming uh, transition that we're heading into? Uh, do you want to take and uh, do some brainstorming or uh, just present some ideas on uh, for discussion and or uh, some kind of project that we could uh, help contribute to the overall um, uh, community preparation for the next go round with any kind of pandemic that's uh, going to be next. OK, we've got a quite chatty group tonight. Well, I do have a question. If, if there was, you know, um, a bioterrorism kind of deal, um, who would be primarily responsible? The health department or with the fire department or who's, who's, uh, you know, if we had a problem, let's say a smallpox thing. Remember, that was the big thing 20 years ago. We had a task force to look at that. We had a, a, a plan on how to vaccinate a large number of people in a small period. So, but but that was a, a, a task force of some kind. Um, what's the relationship if there was a, a disaster like that? Who's responsible? Who has to do what? And are we situated to help? That's my question. So to answer your question, um, we have plans for everything from zombie attacks to anthrax being released at the event center. Um, in fact, we had a meeting this week to talk to with our public health response planner about um, how that was going and make sure that he was up to speed with all of the different past exercises. He's currently planning uh, an exercise for staff right now since we have so many new staff um, so that they know their roles when it comes time. Depending on what the emergency is, if it's something like anthrax or smallpox, then health department, um, I would be incident command. If it were something that was more of a hazmat sort of issue, then fire chief Doug Short 
um, is Incident Command. Um, we have been Incident Command together for COVID for the last year and a half, almost two years now. So we get along really well and we work well together and our staff works really well together. Um, so that's the good news. Um, so we have the plans laid out. We had long conversations with the new staff all about strategic national stockpile and you know that 72 hour window and everything that we need to do to stand up. Um, so is it going to go smoothly? No, I mean, it never does, but do many of us know what we're doing and we've gone through these exercises before? Yes. And so we'll be there to, to hold the hands and get everybody up to speed. And I'm hoping that you knocked on wood when you said the words you did in your question, because um, I'm knocking on wood right now that we can get through this pandemic and this emergency before the next one comes. Um, so I have a little bit of a breather to, to train those staff and get them ready. So I got a question. I mean, you okay? So let's say it was an anthrax deal. Do we have tens of thousands of doses of um, Cipro sitting, standing by? That's with the strategic national stockpile. And so it would be pushed out to us. It would be the push pack that would come. Okay, and it would have up to and including the uh, the protect uh, protective clothing and everything else. That That's part of the push pack. So it that push pack has everything we need. We also we have a stockpile of PPE, um, but that Cipro and everything else that comes, that is part of the push pack that comes um, when when I when I recognize that there's a problem, or the state notifies us that we've had a problem, um, that's where we make that phone call, and then we go and meet that group with the strategic national stockpile. We get what we need, and we come back and we start immediately so is that um stockpile um how do i say this without i suppose some a lot of this is confidential but is it flown it is. In or is it salted all through the uh, country and close by so it's a combination it depends there's some parts and pieces that are throughout the state and then there are some parts and pieces that are nationally spread throughout um they know that they have essentially, you know, 24 hours or less to get it to us. And that's part of the federal plans and part of the state plans. So it it is possible, you know, those ventilators that so famously were talked about with Springfield were part of the strategic national stockpile. If if we need it, it'll get here. Now, depending on what the event is, if it's um, you know, an anthrax attack and they don't know how far it's spread and it's not localized, then it may be something um, where they don't necessarily bring it directly to us. We have to go meet them yeah. and pick it up. Otherwise, um, you know, they get it to you. If we have to shut down a place, a building and take care of everybody inside, they're gonna bring it to us. If it's something that's regional, we're gonna have to go get it and bring it back. And we have teams that are trained to do those things, not only in our department, but throughout the city with multiple departments because this will have to be an all hands on deck event. Will it uh, require mobilization or um, be augmented with our volunteer groups? Depending on what the event is, yes. I mean, that's why we have such a good relationship with fires because they have medical reserve corps and they have their emergency preparedness volunteers. And so, yes, they have a method to activate them in an emergency and pull them in um, and do the just in time training and everything else that's needed for that very specific um, issue that comes up. Excellent. OK, sounds like it's uh, it's all in the notebook, ready to go. It is now, of course, you know, the detail parts all have to be filled in as we go. Um, but yeah, so, you know, we're all hoping that we don't have to open the notebook to certain pages because we we don't want to go to those pages but but those plans are in place we're ready to go and part of the job of our public health response planner and the emergency response planner over um, at fire is to set up those trainings those exercises make sure the notebooks are updated make sure the staff are trained in between so that they at least have an idea when they're walking in about what needs to be done 
is there anything that uh, we need to do um, as a health uh, board to, <clears throat> how do I say, prepare to hold our end up other than uh, what you've already done, do you think? Or do we have to bring anything else to the table to help? Immediately, no, but I can promise you that if if that sort of an event were to happen, um, especially if it were one of those, you know, we have 72 hours to give Cipro to everyone in Independence. Uh, I'm not sure what you guys are doing that day, but I'm really hoping that you guys are coming, getting ready to hand out some Cipro. Yeah, got it. Okay, thank you. So um, when are we looking at any follow-up training exercises? Anything uh, in the books on the calendar? Um, our public health emergency response planner was planning something. Um, he was being all he he was all being all secretive yesterday. So I have a feeling he's going to try to do a surprise exercise first for us. Um, but we'll be doing a full scale one, uh, probably either out at Independence Athletic Complex or Adventure Oasis, probably sometime this winter. And I will happily invite you guys to come and either observe or drive through. What we've done in the past is, you know, depending on what you were supposed to get, you either got Skittles or you got M&Ms. Um, so, I mean, you guys are free to drive through a couple of times and have different symptoms and get different candy. That always works. Huh. I I, uh, I really think that would make a, a big difference, uh, having some kind of motivation like can this Skittles or uh, M&M's. Hey, um, what about um, uh, oh, oh well? Um, are there any other uh, questions regarding the uh, pandemic issue and uh, any uh, follow-up that we might do? It sounds like you know you've really got uh, the. Um, bases covered when it comes to preparation and so um, but when it comes to training you know the turnover and stuff it's going to have to start from scratch probably as far as re uh, designating who's who and and who's doing what and so that's that's I, a lot of work i am incredibly fortunate that our staff that we've hired and how some of them have brought in they're they're very talented they're very smart um you know, our emergency, our public health emergency response planner, Connor, uh, had volunteered where he was an emergency um, preparedness volunteer through fire since he was a teenager. And so this is his bread and butter. He's participated in these exercises as a volunteer for years. He's excited about it. He knows what he's talking about and he's motivated. So we are we are incredibly fortunate to have really talented, very smart, very outgoing staff members so um one um one thing that the pandemic will provide is an incentive and a motivation from the community i i bet you if you had trouble finding volunteers before now you're going to find the community as a whole is going to be much more interested in helping and um, finding out what the what is going to be done and how they can help the next time you know we we saw that with medical reserve corps um years ago when they first came over to independence they had about 15 to 20 members um and during the pandemic um that membership swelled to over a thousand members in our region so i mean it really does speak volumes about how wonderful our community is as a whole across the Kansas City region, that so many of them, when there was a need, came out in droves to join in. So, and we continue using those same Medical Reserve Corps volunteers. They're great. So do you have a full um, uh, complement of volunteers or do you still have some needs? There's always needs because I'll be honest, um, just like everyone is seeing right now, you know, volunteers get burned out. Um, they get tired. They, a lot of them had, um, you know, work picked up or there's fewer members at their work, so they can't volunteer nearly as much. Um, so we're always looking for more volunteers. The biggest issue is I know we have enough volunteers right now to be doing what we're doing for our vaccination clinics. Um, 
What we need more of are people coming to the vaccine clinics. That's what we really need. Um, we have willing people to give shots, but not necessarily a ton of willing people to get those shots. And we know they're out there, but they just won't come to us. So now, is there um, any uh, potential for door to door kind of going um, um, uh, up to the homes and uh, like the old days with uh, house visits? So that has definitely been discussed. Um, in the state of Missouri, there appears to not be a political will um, for that to be done. Um, and when we had discussed doing it over the summer, there were um, some potential issues with safety that were brought up. Um, I mean, it's the, I know when it was suggested for Springfield, um, our, our governor made it very clear that he was not supportive of us using any sort of state funds or state staff to support such efforts. So, um, so we have not done that. We have not given up hope that that may be what we have to do eventually. But in the same spirit, we do homebound vaccinations. If somebody contacts us and tells us that they can't get to a vaccination site, um, right now it's every Friday. They're out there doing homebound vaccinations and they are happy to do that. So if we're invited to their home, we've we've been going. So uh, we've got some great uh, medical personnel that are willing to go to that extent of uh, um, involvement and, and make the difference. And so uh, and the kudos to their, their um, efforts. And that's really uh, greatly appreciated. And uh, for all you guys out there that um, don't hear it enough, we really do appreciate what you do. Um, so, um, okay. Any other thoughts or comments before we wrap this up? Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Christina, for the uh, enlightenment as far as uh, I knew we had a lot of preparation, but um, I know the trailer and all the uh, equipment has, you know, had places, uh, it's had to find a home a number of times, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it doesn't look like a, a lot when you think of a community of 120,000. But it's a good start, and it definitely has, um, um, it keeps us uh, at least mindful of the issue by having the trailer. And uh, it might be something that we could bring by one evening, and uh, we, when we start meeting again, we can have, because I remember they did that uh, a number of years back, and I thought it was interesting, and might be again. We can look to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> well, if there are no other thoughts or comments, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.